right? I want us to take a step back because I want us to have some context into what we're reading and it not just be um, something that we're just putting our own imagination to. So I want us to understand because there's power and there's depth and there's richness in our understanding of God's word. So I want to take us back. And if you're writing notes, we want, we're going to go back and we, we're going to uh, study a little bit in John uh, chapter 8, verse 12. This is what the word of God says there. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, I want to just really quick uh, preface. I, I've been sitting for this message for, for some time now. It's been actually in our minds, and every time we reflect, we're like, it could go in, in, in this part of this message. And this week was wild, you guys. Like, it was wild. Yesterday was even wilder, okay? I, I didn't um, slice my wrist or anything, but I did end up, uh, like, shanking myself. Uh, and, and I know I'm from East Side, so I know what a shank looks like, but I've never actually had one. Um, and I was like, I'm speaking tomorrow. I can't go to the hospital and get stitches. I was going to bandage this up. Like, it was a crazy day, Okay. But I'm going to tell you this, as I was prepping for this, I heard the Holy Spirit say, stop with your, like, PowerPoint. Like, I even went back and just deleted some stuff. He said, you just go in and you speak truth. This was before even, like, the whole chaos of our nation happened. And when that happened, I said, I understand why. We're going to get into some truth today. So there's not going to be a whole lot of one-liners on the screen because most of them I just deleted. And we're going to say we're going to stick to truth. And there's going to be some things you can take away, I promise you. But I need you to stay with me, okay? I need you to stay with me because there's richness in this. It, it, here he says, um, I am the light of the world. Now, it says, I am the light of the world. That alone is a profound statement. That alone is a profound statement. We understand the need for light. There's light here. Even the way we design lighting um, in this space, there's purpose in it. You know, when you walk into a room, it's natural to just want to flick the lights on. We know it illuminates dark places. You know, it even sets the tone. You know, uh, lighting sets the tone. Like, it's, it's exciting. It's joyful. It's scary. It's dark. You know, like, it sets the mood for things. Um, it, you know, it can draw you to or, or draw you away you know, and, and in this scripture, Jesus was in a time in an area in Israel where they're celebrating a holiday uh, called Sukkot. We don't, we don't have to go deep into that and you're like, oh, here we go. It, we, we're not going like way deep, okay? Um, but I do want you to understand this because there's purpose and reason when Jesus spoke these words. Part of celebrating that holiday is that everyone would gather at the temple to worship. And, and I, I have an image of the temple um, this, is, this is what it would look like. And you see some, some arrows pointing there, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit. But there's different sections of the temple where there was like the women's quarters, you know, where women could gather. Then you, you can take a, a step further where, where men could gather. And then if you went inside, that was only um, for, for the priest, right? But there's a, an area where it's common common area, and everyone could stand there and, and gather and worship. But what you'll notice in this image is that there's Four uh, tall candelabras or vestibles. They're not vegetables, vestibles. They're, they're, they're standing um, tall. There are four of them, and they would stand there, and they were huge. They were they're about 70 feet tall, made out of, like, marble. And what would happen during this time is that they would light these candles, and it would create, um, every day, actually, of the year, they, they, would, they would light these candles up, right? Because it meant that now you know, regardless of where you are in the city, when you can see the light, you know how close in proximity you are to the temple. That's where the presence of God would reside. So you knew how close in proximity you were to God's presence. But during this time, they would gather together for a lighting ceremony, and they would light these candles up at this time. And, and that would let them know, like, this is a time where we celebrate. At this time, they would also start playing music. They would uh, dance like David danced because they're also celebrating the fact that the you know, Israelites were lost for 40 years, but now through fire, you know, and this light that came was able to guide them into freedom. So they're celebrating all of this. They, it represented a hope of salvation in the future that one day they would be able to stand and be in the presence of the Spirit at one time. Um, it, it represented a prophecy. There's so much richness in this. So now y'all are Bible scholars. Now, now y'all know a little bit more. Now there's richness in this, okay? Now I want you to understand, understand this, that 
when Jesus spoke these words, he would be standing at the Mount of Olives, removed from the temple where he could see and oversee the temple. And I want you to, um, if, if you can share and just put up John 8, verse 12 again. Um, when we read, you know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You know, can you put up the picture of where the Mount of Olives, it's not the one that's lit up, but as you can see the temple at a distance. Um, Jesus would be standing far removed. Oh, that one works. Um, Jesus would be standing far removed at the Mount of Olives overseeing the city and the temple is now lit up. The temple is now lit up. So when he's speaking to them, he's saying, look, you are the light of the world. He's not just giving an analogy. See, before we read this and see this, we'd be like, oh, cool, Jesus is a flashlight. You know, like he, he lights up dark places. And, um, you know, but, but that's not what he's saying. What, what he's saying here is, is I want you to see, see this, read this in, in context. I want you to hear me when I tell you. Jesus is probably thinking, like, I, I need you to catch a visual He's saying, these pillars that you have been lighting up day after day after day, they, they've set a purpose for some time. But, but see, you're going to understand that there's going to come a time when you're going to realize that I, I am the light of this world, not these pillars anymore. It, Jesus is talking and he's, and he's pointing at these things. Can you just imagine you're standing at this mount and you oversee the city with this lit up area and he's saying, I am that. But see, what we need to understand is, is that he's also disturbing what they've known. He's also shaking up all they've known to be God's presence. It, you know, so we've been doing this the whole time. So you mean that is with the light of the world. It's, you're, you're telling me, you're the light of the world. And if we go on to read, we see that people were, were a little frustrated, some confused, some frustrated. And, and I love it. And, and honestly, I'd even recommend, go and read all of, all of John. Go in and read it. I did my homework. It's like four and a half chapters a day. Not that much for a week. You can get it done, okay? You're gonna understand even deeper, okay? And he's saying, he's telling them, Everything you've known, we're going to scratch that in some time. I am the light of the world. You don't have to go to this place to find God's presence. It's going to be here. Like, I am. You just have to know me. And when they start getting a little frustrated, this is where you do your homework. When they start getting a little frustrated, he's like, why are you frustrated, bro? He's unapologetic. He's like, you know why you're mad? Because you don't know me. See, you think you've known me, but you're frustrated because I'm shaking the trees a little bit because the reality of it is if you knew me, you knew that I am that I am. If you knew me, you knew that I am the light, but you're frustrated because I'm shaking the narrative of your religion. I am the light of the world. I am. You, you know, it reminds me, that often it's the proximity to people where we start to recognize and know and hear who they really are. Not just by what we religiously do. It's not just by showing up on Sunday. It's by our closeness and our walk with Jesus. And see, they've just been used to doing things. So when they're told something different, they're like, whoa, you're disrupting what I just know to do. And he's like, see, I need you to know me. You think you know me. You don't know me. It sounds a lot like today's culture, but not anyone in this church. It sounds a lot like today's culture. You know, imagine, imagine your neighbor moving in next door and you're about to deliver some like welcome to the hood cookies. You know, like welcome, we're here, we're your neighbors. And... And you, and you realize it gets still dark in there. And you're like, oh, dang, what a shame. Like, you haven't get, gotten your electricity plugged in. Like, we PG&E, you need me to call anybody? Um, you know, do you need help with anything? Do you need to come? Oh, oh no, we, we do things with candles here. And you're like, I did the math on that too. It's over $1,000 a month to light up your house with about three bedrooms um, with candles every day, okay? It's pricey. And sometimes people just think, well, I don't know. See, that's often us. We would be like, you know, I, I know, I know that's what you've known to do, but I promise you, it's worth flipping a switch. 
it, it's worth it. And sometimes that's us in following Jesus. We're like, you know, it sounds like it just costs too much. Right now it does. But just watch what your sin will lead you. Just watch where things that you're doing are going to lead you. You're going to realize that costs a lot more than following Jesus. I'm not saying following Jesus is cheap. It's not. But it's so worth it. And you just don't know it yet because you don't know him. See, if you knew him, you knew it would be worth it. If you knew him, you'd be, you know it would be worth to, to tie the knot already. You're with her. You know that it would be worth it to have a blessing over your marriage. You know it would be worth it to drop everything that's numb you. You know it would be worth it, but you don't know him. So you can't experience the full measure of peace. You can't experience the full measure of hope. You can't experience the full measure of redemption because you haven't even gotten to repentance. You haven't experienced him. You know, we catch ourselves questioning everything. I am running out of time, y'all. We question everything. What does it look like to be a believer? Is it, is it just to show up on Sunday? Is it, you know, just to put it, post a, an out of context te uh, text on your, your social, I'm just gonna call it what it is sometimes, not even having to reference what it's trying to say, y'all. You know, is it just me trying to be nice? You know, is it, is it me just creating in my own idea of what it looks like? You know, and, and we're offended when we're held to a higher standard. You know, can I just tell you, you're, you're not offended with me, sis. You're not offended with, with me, friend. You're offended because you don't know the truth. We don't dig into truth. And so you're offended when someone calls you out and holds you to a higher standard. But if you just read the truth, you would know these are just the words of Jesus. This is just the word of Jesus. And, and you know, can I just keep it honest? I told you I was going to go rogue a little bit. You guys, I wasn't sure where Holy Spirit was going to lead me. But sometimes as culture, as people, we just been saying stuff. Like, like, we just be saying things to just say things like, um, only God can judge me. And I'm sure no one in the room has ever said that before. You know, like, why are you coming at me? Like, only God can judge me. People just be saying things to just say things. Can I just tell you, be so grateful that the... In God's grace, he would put people around you to call you out. That's his grace. Because let me just tell you and remind you that when God judges you, it's final. There's no going back. Final judgment day. If we read our word, we'd recognize that. Can we just be grateful when people speak into us and speak life? It's not always going to feel good. It's often going to feel grimy. It's often going to feel like I want to get upset. Can I just tell you, that is the upside down kingdom. You're going to feel uncomfortable sometimes. All that to just say, can we just stop like living offended, y'all? And allow people to just hold us to a higher standard some, sometimes. Can we just stop being offended so that God could actually work through us? And sometimes it's through people too. You know, proximity to the Father changes us. But see, Jesus, he's, he's radical. Jesus sometimes just be wiling out in how he does things that you're like, what? He goes in Matthew 5 where we've been in our scripture in five, verse 14, it says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. See, now we understand that it's not just we get to just be like all flashlights sometimes. You don't just get to like, you know, like just pop in and out sometimes. We see that this is a gigantic city. It, it can't be hidden. It means that where that light is, people know where they are in proximity to the Holy Spirit. They know where they are in proximity to who God is. And he's saying, you are that. You are the light of the world. And he goes from I am the light to you are the light. And people, see, they weren't used to hearing that back then. People aren't even really used to, to hearing that now, right? It says you are the light. It, it, you know, and so when we read this, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and give light to everyone in the house. See, now it's like, okay, hold up, Jesus. I'm okay with you being the light because, you know, you're Jesus. Um, you know, but me? You know, do, do you know me? I'm good with you. But, but me, see, you know, I, I still got some things. Not just some things. I got some things. J Jesus is sharing our purpose. He's, he's telling us our why. So that, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
Jesus is calling us to boldness. He was bold. He is bold. He was calling us to boldness, not to say his name in scarcity, not to be just talking about Jesus, but to be living a life that actually reflects him. You know, a daily surrendered life. I'm surrendered in my workplace. I'm surrendered in my home. I'm I'm surrendered in parenting. I'm surrendered in my marriage. I'm surrendered in my workplace. I'm surrendered in my college. I'm surrendered in my classroom. I'm surrendered when I go to the grocery store. I'm surrendered in traffic. I'm surrendered when my emotions are whack. I'm surrendered. That is what it means. And he's calling us to this type of boldness. Jesus says, stop hiding your walk. You, I'm, I'm gonna ask, I asked somebody to come in and just do volunteer because, you know, I wasn't gonna do this to just anybody. And it was gonna look a little, you know, crazier, but I figured, you know, this is when parent tax comes in. Like, you know, you just do, do a girl a favor, you know. So Ava's gonna come up really, I, I wanna show this. <laughs> Edith Wharton said, said this, um, You know, there are two ways of spreading light to be the candle or a mirror that reflects it. You know, we we aren't necessarily the candle, we're just the mirror that is reflecting it. And and here here's the thing: you know, when we are we're called to be light, this huge city, right? I I was actually gonna use the the suit of the candelabra from from, um Beat and the Beast. And I was like, that that would take a real effort from someone. So this would do. But see, I can't send Ava to the grocery store and expect people to not be like, uh, October 31st is a while away. Um, I can't expect her to be working out in the gym and be like, you know, you still got that on. Um, I can't expect her to walk into school on a normal day and in a classroom and sit through the entire day and people will not be like, why are you wearing that? I can't expect to send her anywhere and it just not at least be a little noticeable. It, 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 I also can't expect her to do that. And, and hey, why, why don't you uh, go to the movies that way and expect her not to be a little uncomfortable, not to feel like she's standing out just a little bit, not to feel like sometimes in awkward moments she's gonna realize, oh shoot, in the mirror, I, I'm still wearing this. Here's the thing. We can't get used to walking into places pretending like we're not carrying the light of Jesus. We can't, we can't get into arguments pretending like we're not carrying the light of Jesus. We can't get into conversations, into political battles. We can't start posting. We can't stop going places pretending like we're not carrying the light of Jesus. We are carrying it. We don't get to take it off. We are carrying it 24-7. It might feel a little uncomfortable. Can I tell you, sometimes I'm frustrated being a believer. And sometimes Matthew's like, you can't do that. You know, sometimes I'm like, Jesus, just, just let me get all crazy right now. Just, just let me say what I need to say. And here's my reminder, I'm carrying him always. And so it's not a matter of whether I can't. It's whether you taint that or not. You can, but it's whether you diminish it or not. Thank you, Ava. <laughs> so I'm gonna wrap up here in a bit. I wanna give you just three things in in the ways that we can walk out of here and just be reminded of how we can walk out the light of Jesus. One, we have to be reminded, and and these might not be on your screen, um, but I want you to write this down. I want you to be reminded that we have the power, but it's the power through the Holy Spirit. It is not ours. The word of God says in Acts chapter one, verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You get to be the billboard for him in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We have the power when we carry his light, we have to be reminded, but it's not ours. So we can't just modify and will ourselves into being anything. We have to walk with him. So he starts leaving residue on us. So we just start becoming more of who he is. And number two, safety. We're called to be a safe place for people. Can I just remind you of that church? We are called to be a safe place for people. I will never forget one of the first times Um, that we um, even started going around uh, church people after I had left church for many years. 
Um, and, and Matthew and I happened to, to um, be driving by my parents' house and we knew there was somebody else, there was a few other people there and we're like, dang, there's church people there. I don't know if we really wanna go by there. Um, and we did and we got off the car, but we weren't going inside the house because they were inside the house. So we just wait outside and I remember calling my parents like, oh, we're like, we're here, like outside, if you wanna come out. And they came out with everyone, y'all. Um, and I remember like, oh gosh, okay, here we go. Um, but I will never forget that it wasn't like, oh my God, oh, 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 um, you're Anna and um, you're the boyfriend that is living with her and you're the pastor's daughter. Like it, they embraced us with so much love. Their smile were exactly the same that I would see it on any other day. They made us feel so safe that it would be okay to then show up again and then again and then again until we took a step foot into church. It was a safe place. May we never forget that it does not mean that we don't continue to be who he calls us to be, which is a safe place and love for anybody. Can I tell you, anybody that comes across you, any body that comes across you, you are entrusted by God to be the light and testimony that he's called you to be. And my prayer is that we would be worthy of it. Number three, authority. We must recognize that the authority is in his power. He gives us authority. That does not mean, and I love when last week Pastor Matthew talked about being, you know, a, a, a peace giver versus a peacemaker. That does not mean that you just don't say a word, right? He gives us authority to also walk in his power, to also know when we can stand and say, yeah, that doesn't really go with what I, with, with the biblical values that I hold. Yeah, you know what? Can I tell you, brother, sister, I love you so much. And because I love you, I have to tell you this. That attitude, girl, I just don't look good on you. You know, or, or there's something, I see that there's a need in your life. And can I just tell you, God calls you to more. He still gives us authority and power, but we must also exercise, it, exercise that in the covering that he's given us and who he is. You know, uh, during summer, there, it, it's a little wild in our house because it, it's, um, we have four kids and they all have, different activities and different summer camps and different sports that kick off early on. And so, but it's always odd and weird in our house because we never have them all at one time until about some point in July. So literally from the moment that we get off at summer, they're off. Like Ava was gone for almost a month. Um, Chloe was gone. Uh, then they're at cheer camp the minute they go off. But during the time when it's kind of off, it's funny how Levi, our youngest, starts to gravitate towards whoever is in the house and who, you know, he starts kind of building stronger relationships with. And for quite a bit of time, it was just me, Matthew, and then Kai and Levi. So as always, I was his everything. And he started having conversations with Kai. And um, Kai was sharing pictures of him when he was growing up. And he showed him pictures of when he had really short hair. If you know Levi, he's got really long hair, curly long hair. And um, all both boys have had long hair and we cut it off at a certain time. And we've always had conversation with them, like, when are you ready to cut your hair? So Kai showed him a, a picture of when he first cut his hair and he got to dye his hair blue because he plays for the Titans and Titans are blue. So he let him dye his hair blue to kind of cheer on his team. And um, Levi said, I'm ready to cut my hair, mom. I'm like, you are? And I want to dye it blue. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so I said, okay, because he cut his hair, right? Like I love his hair, but I also want him to, to make his own choices. And so I said, okay, um, we can talk about that. Um, and are you sure you're ready to cut your hair? Because then it hit me like, oh no, he wants to cut his hair. Are, are you sure you want to cut your hair? I, I'm ready to cut my hair, mom. Um, we had like, everybody was in like, I think he's going to cut his hair. Then Ava shows up. A and Ava, I said, guess what? Brother said he wants to cut his hair. He is not cutting his hair. I'm like, he wants to cut his hair. Don't tell him anything, Ava. We're sitting in the living room. And I said, Levi, tell Ava how you want to cut your hair. And he looks at Ava, and she looks at him, and he said, I don't. <laughs> this is what it reminded me of. We often are so settled in what our voice is, but we start letting other voices in, and we forget who our master is. I'm not Levi's master, but I definitely have some authority over him. Sometimes. <laughs> 
But can I just tell you, sometimes we just start watering down when we start to believe, when we start even just leaning over, you hear a voice, why'd you look? The eyes of the Father are here. His truth is right here. As you hear it, you have the authority to say no. When you even hear voices like, you're not gonna be healed, I have authority of the Holy Spirit, and right now I'm speaking healing. You're never gonna be changed. I have the authority of the Holy Spirit, and I'm speaking redemption. Your marriage will never change. I have the authority of the Holy Spirit, and there is gonna be healing in my marriage. That will never change. You will never get that. I'm speaking in the authority of the Holy Spirit, and I am that I am gives me some promises. But when we start leaning into voices that don't belong to God, we must be careful. I love Jackie Hill Perry and she said this, you know, if, if you've ever been to Olive Garden, y'all know like, like what's the best of Olive Garden? What, what, yes, the breadsticks. Dang those breadsticks. Those breadsticks are the jam. But do you ever go and, and you have the breadsticks and then by the time that you order your food, you're like, I actually don't know what I wanna order because I'm not that hungry anymore, but you order anyways. And then you still keep eating the breadsticks and then when your food comes, you can't eat it no more. Yeah. When we start filling up with who God is, it can come, but it ain't gonna satisfy you. And can I tell you, just like them breadsticks, there's carbs, you carry the weight of it, okay? But you're carrying who God is. You are carrying all of who He is. That it doesn't matter what comes your way. It can even look good and look appetizing and you're like, no, I'm carrying the light of the Holy Spirit and there is nothing worth tainting that. There is nothing worth tainting that. So today, I just want us to do an inventory check. You know, how, what does that look like? How do I even start analyzing this in my life? Some practical and easy ways. Do I love God? Can I tell you loving people, loving God? It looks a certain way. It, it requires action. Do I hear God? You know, hearing God requires leaning in. Do I experience God? Well, what do you mean by that? You know, does it stop at just being aware or does it lead you into repentance? We live in a culture where it's like, I'm so self-aware. That is so good. But what if it goes against to what the Word of God says? What if it goes against to the makeup of who God says that you are? Then awareness is only good if you lead it to healing and lead it to repentance and crucify it. That's the only time it's going to be good. Otherwise, it's just information. Do you love God? Do you hear God? Do you experience God? And I just wanna make a call to us today. Church, there's gonna be, we're walking into a week where we're gonna hear a lot of things. We're walking into a week where we're gonna see a lot of things and we need to choose now that we represent God and we will love people because we love God. It does not matter. It doesn't mean it shifts your position. It doesn't mean it shifts anything about what you believe. It just means that it doesn't shift who God calls us to be. We love people because we love God and nothing is worth tainting the light that he calls us to steward and be.